Bonjour tout le monde, it's Diane. Welcome back to my channel where we talk about everyday French life and beyond. And if we've never met, I'm the American behind the Living Abroad Lifestyle blog, We in France, that you should check out. I've linked it down below. Today, I am the very special guest uh, of Kathy Henton of Le Tasting Room. She runs this very special wine tour business with her husband, Nigel, right outside of Tours, France. And that's in the Loire Valley. So I'm here at her home. We're going to talk about wine. She's going to educate us and we're going to get right into it. I'm Cathy Henton and I run Le Tasting Room, a small wine education and wine tour business in the Loire Valley based close to Amboise and Tours. We uh, offer full day and half day experiences and sometimes short breaks for people. Uh, it's a really easy ride from Paris. It's only 55 minutes from Montparnasse in Paris down to saint pierre des corps And also Amboise, where we are only 10 minutes away from, is probably the most visited area of the Loire Valley because we are close to all the great chateaux that you may have heard of, like Chenonceau, Villandry, Azelle Rideau and Amboise itself. What we do, we specialize in wine uh, and we welcome you to our home. We have a very small winemaker's home in the Loire Valley, which is in some ways typical and in other ways very atypical. It's typical in so far as it is built into the limestone hillside called Tufo, the limestone which uh, is remarkable in the Loire Valley, which was quarried in the centuries to build all the big chateaux and the caves around here. And this is where winemakers store their wines. And also because our main room, our dining room, is partially uh, hewn out of the limestone hillside. So we, our house, part of it is 18th century and part of it is maybe many millions of years old. We welcome you to our home, which is um, um, where we have a small tasting room and we spend the morning tasting a range of wines from all over the Loire Valley to give you a, a really broad understanding of what goes on in the Loire, not just in this little area where we live, and tell you all about growing vines and making wine here in the Loire Valley, the difficulties and the pleasures, uh, the stories behind the producers, um, the geographical issues, the climate, the soil, the terroir, the food and wine pairing aspects of wine in the Loire Valley and we enjoy a lunch with you, we eat with you. Uh, we are a very personal small business with, we deal with people, two to six people generally for our groups uh, and after that we take you out into the vineyards to have a look at the vines themselves. I then will often pass you to Nigel, my husband, uh, who used to be a farmer and retrained in viticulture about 15 years ago. We actually get you out into the vineyard and look at vines. And we are in the Loire Valley. Uh, here is Paris in France and here is the Loire Valley here. So the Loire River is the longest wild river in France. It's 629 miles long. The winemaking region covers about half of that region, but you look at the source, it's right the way down here in the Rhone Valley. So a long, long way. And in the past, this would have been the main motorway of France, which explains why in, say, the 12th century, wines from the Loire Valley were already being exported all over the world because the Loire was the transport. But the Loire Valley is a region that you really should get involved in if you're really interested in learning about wine, because here we have probably the widest range and the greatest diversity of wine styles of any region in France. Well, the, probably the easiest way to think about this is geographical location. Most quality wine in France is named after the geographical zone where it's produced. So, for example, here is Tours. And we live just here in a small village called Noisé, which forms part of the Vouvray appellation. I don't know if you speak French or not. Je m'appelle Cathy. My name is Cathy. Appellation contrôlée. Controlled name. Appellation d'origine contrôlée. Controlled name of origin. So Vouvray gives its name to this zone of production, which makes Chenin only white wines. But there are, in fact, eight villages within the zone, of which we live in one. And as a winemaker, as long as you have your vines planted within this zone, one of those eight villages, of which Vouvray gives it its name, and you follow the list of rules for that particular place, then you can put the word Vouvray on your label. So, when you're looking at the label like this, what are you looking for and how are you, how are you unravelling the label, the information on the label? Well, we can see here that in big letters there is Clos David. A Clos is actually a walled vineyard and this is the name of the actual parcel of vines where the grapes come from. 
Saumur is the appellation and 2015 is the vintage. So all the grapes that go into this wine were picked from the 2015 vintage. Arnaud Lambert, vigneron à Brézé, he, Arnaud, is the winemaker and he is based just outside Saumur and he works totally organically. Now, how do I know he's working organically? I turn this round and on the back, I see this little green leaf here. This is what you're going to see if you're looking for a wine which has been made organically. All right, Kathy. so tell me, I think there's a lot of marketing buzz around yes. organic versus biodynamic versus natural wines. What has more sugar? What's good for you? Can you tell us a little bit about these different designations? I can. Well, first of all, I think what's good to point out is that probably 75% of all France's wines are made of what we call conventionally. And conventionally means that they are using chemicals to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, the problem with that is, as a consumer, you don't know whether it's somebody who's using a lot or whether it's somebody who's using a little. So as a consumer, if you want to be sure that wines are being made in a more natural way, then the good choice is to opt for organic wine. Now, these are both organic wines made from organic producers. Um, the difference, the main difference between organic viticulture and conventional viticulture is that they are not allowed to use a lot of the chemicals that conventional growers will use. For example, the biggest example is the use of Roundup in the vineyard. Uh, when you apply something like Roundup, you don't just kill the weeds, you kill absolutely everything in the soil. And then, therefore, if you do that, then you are sort of forced to compensate for that by then adding chemically produced fertilizers to right. give more nutrition to the soil because you've damaged the nutrition of the soil. Now, organic growers can't use that product at all, which means that they have more work to do in the vineyard. They have to work the soil, is how we call it, manually or sometimes using a horse, which is lovely to see, but it's a very small percentage of vineyards that, use, that work their vineyards using a horse. Uh, biodynamic. Uh, biodynamics, that's a whole different ball game. Biodynamic producers are already organic. If you start off with your vines conventional, it'll take you three years to convert them to organics here, of using no chemicals or pesticides in your vineyards. And now biodynamic viticulture also has certification, um, and it's even more stringent on the use of um, the chemicals that are permitted within organics. For example, we have a problem with mildew in the vineyards, uh, and we use uh, copper sulfate to deal with that. That's permitted in organics because it's a natural elemental product. But the levels that you can use in biodynamics are far reduced. The levels of sulfites that you are at bottling in biodynamics are far reduced. And the elements of biodynamic viticulture is a much more holistic view. It takes into account the balance between the solar system, the moon, the calendar, the solar system, uh, and the use of a lot of homeopathic tisans and sprays which are applied at certain growing points throughout the vineyard year to add nutrition um, and vigour to the soil at certain points. It's a very sort of homeopathic holistic approach, so some people think that it's unproven, because it is. It's the, it's the system which was invented by Rudolf Steiner in the 1930s, and like homeopathic medicine, it works on the same basis, that you have a very small quantity and you dilute it greatly, and that gives you more power and more, yeah. more effectiveness in the vineyard. So you can work organically, and obviously you're concerned with just your vineyard, the vineyard that you can see in front of you, whereas if you're working biodynamically, you're also looking around you, you're looking at the bit of forest over there, you're looking at keeping this little land, bit of land here free, just growing flowers or natural vegetation. You're maybe having animals grazing within the rows, you're maybe growing flowers, you're maybe uh, got another crop here, trying to encourage natural predators that deal with other pests in the vineyard without having to apply any substances of any kind to the vineyard. All biodynamic wine growers are organic to yes, begin with, so yes. it's kind of organic amplified to it's that. It's organic degree. taking it to the furthest extreme that, okay. that, than you, that you can really. Okay, and let me ask you about pricing because obviously yep. with such work and intense processes that are natural, um, the price must be reflected in that, right? Yes, it is reflected in that because your costs do increase probably by about 25% if you work organically than if you're not working organically. Um, and that price is reflected in the bottle. However, I would say that in the Loire Valley, value for money compared with the price that you pay is practically unbeatable in France compared with other regions. For example, this is a sort of 20 euro wine and this is a 22 euro wine here in France. Now, I don't know what that might cost you if you were back in the States, but maybe this might be a $45 bottle of wine, perhaps. So yes, it's not a cheap bottle of wine, but these are at the top of these producers' ranges. Right, and you're not getting uh, Roundup, you're not getting herbicides in your wine, no. you're not getting added sugar, added flavors, any kind 
Nick or anything. Right. Just, and what's more, these both of these producers, and this is something which isn't necessarily controlled by organics, but both these producers are working very naturally. That is, they're using the natural yeast present on the grape. They're not adding a commercially produced yeast. Right. So uh, their yields are smaller. They're working from old vines very often. Um, and yes, it takes more care and attention. And it also, in the winery, they are using the minimum amount of additions to wine during the winemaking process, right up to bottling, and using the minimal amount of sulfites possible to keep that wine preserved and, and safe for okay. you to drink. Okay, Kathy. so the next thing I want to ask you about is yes. sulfites. I feel like it's a dirty word in winemaking. Yes. People say sulfites cause my headache, I don't like wines with sulfites, they're bad. Uh, what are sulfites and why should we care about them or not? Okay, well we should care about sulfites. Yes, indeed we should because they are an essential uh, addition to winemaking. Sulfites are what we use in the winery to protect wine from oxidation and bacterial spoilage. I think that in the past, if you to go back to the beginning of the 19th century, we were using wild amounts of sulfites in wine, which is partly why wine took years and years to come around and you could keep it for 30 years, because we were using up to 500 milligrams per litre of sulfites. Now these days, uh, in organic viticulture, so these kind of people, the maximums permitted are 150 grams for white and 100 for red. And I say they're the maximums. People like Arnaud are using less than 50. So they're using the very smallest amounts of sulfites to keep that wine safe. But to be honest, sulfites are a very essential part of winemaking. Now regarding your headaches, or my headaches, because I do suffer from wine headaches myself too, and sometimes there seems to be no rhyme or reason why I have a headache. I've had a glass of wine and I feel lousy the next day. Is it sulfites? To be honest, no, it's probably not sulfites because sulfites do not directly give you headaches. If, however, you are somebody that has asthma or breathing problems, then possibly sulfites can be an irritant for you, in which case you should try and avoid wines with high levels of sulfites, but they're not listed on the label. And to be honest, that's because it's a confusing chemical addition and it's not quite as straightforward as it might seem to the average consumer. So I would say don't avoid wines with sulfites in, but the permitted levels in the US are a lot higher than they are here in, in Europe in your EU legislation, you're allowed to use up to 350 grams, milligrams uh, per litre in the US versus our 150, so it's a lot more. How can people know when they're getting a good bottle of wine, or what would be your advice for someone looking to get whatever constitutes good? Okay, well, I think the easiest way to talk about this is to say that you get what you pay for. So you can find a bottle of wine which is inexpensive, but good wine costs money to make uh, and so there is, a, there is a certain price that you need to pay. It doesn't have to be super expensive. If you have a very limited knowledge of wine, I just recommend you go to a local independent wine merchant because these people are buying these kind of wines. They have the knowledge. Having the knowledge of all the wines of all the world is something for the professionals, not for the, for the amateur. Uh, but if you're interested, they're the people, I would do the same myself. Anyway, obviously, Appalachian wine is a, is a good start, a wine from a geographic zone in France, but then above and beyond that, of course, even within an Appalachian, somewhere like Vouvray, for example, where we live, there are about 200 growers, and there are 10 that are doing fantastic things, 10 that are doing amazing things, 10 that are doing awesome things, and 50 that are doing okay, okay things. Yeah. So that's, you need somebody that has that knowledge for you, but be prepared to pay a reasonable amount of money for, for a wine. Okay, thank you so much for watching everyone. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you're notified of future videos right here on my channel. Again, show Kathy and Nigel and the Tasting Room a little bit of love. I've linked everything you need to know down below in the comments and I have no affiliation with them. There's nothing in this for me. They're just a hardworking couple who I've personally known now for years and I wanted to feature them in a video. So if you find yourself in Paris, this is easily accessible uh, here in Tours. Check them out, show them some love, and uh, I'll see you soon. Salut!